Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us this Sunday. It's 830. Welcome to Face the State. We begin with the new president of the University of Connecticut, Thomas Katsileas. And President Katsileas, good to see you here in the program, and congrats on the new job. Thank you very much, Dennis. It's great to be here. What is the number one problem in your judgment facing UConn right now? Actually, you know, the easy answer is to say it's financial, but um, you know, I think that's kind of a cop out. I, I prefer to look at it as just challenges that are, you know, in a constrained environment. And so, for us, uh, it's really not about a number one problem. It's an opportunity. I mean, my my big focus right now is built as a new president is getting my arms around the university, drinking from the fire hose, learning from everyone, but also building my leadership team. So I have two key leadership searches on right now, one for the chief academic officer, which we call a provost, and one for the chief diversity officer for the university. So those are big, big foci. But um, beyond that, I'm, I'm about asking our community, our faculty, staff, and students uh, some formative questions that will lead to a strategic plan that moves the university forward. And what's your vision for UConn over the years? Well, uh, this is a great university with a lot of momentum and a lot of advantages. It's been among the fastest rising public universities in the country over the last two decades, moving from the mid-30s to the top 25. Uh, and uh, it's got great geographic advantages. It's got a strong board. It's got support, you know, supportive state, supportive legislator, legislature. A little bit financially strapped right now, but um, all the ingredients are there. Some fantastic faculty and students. And so the the challenge for us to move to the next level is is one: how can we double research and scholarship across the university? Um, how can we more intentionally align with the economic needs and priorities of the state and the governor? And um, um, how can we um, essentially be a leader in liberal arts education for the 21st century, building on the strength we have in uh, undergraduate education? And for me, that is um, bringing life transformative educational experiences to every student at scale of 24,000, which no one's ever done. You made some headlines this past yeah. week when you announced that there will be free tuition Correct. for students of families who make $50,000 or less. Yes. What made you come to that decision to do that? Yeah, we, we had uh, three motivations in that. One is um, to sharpen the message about the financial aid that we provide and to send a, a clear message, particularly to first generation students who haven't, don't have parents in college, to, um, that this university is for them, that they can afford it, uh, that it is, is, it is accessible. Uh, and we want them. So, so one was about message. One motivation was messaging. The other motivation was to to make it actually more affordable for those students. And the third was to to energize our base, uh, to energize our uh, our students, our faculty, our alums, so the donors who give to the school, to be excited about an initiative that will be transformative for the university and essentially move it further along in its mission than it's ever been. How many students are we talking about here? So, you know, there are 24,000 undergraduates at UConn. This will touch and improve the financial aid package for about 6,000 6, students when it's fully rolled out. So this scale is, is really extraordinary, right? 6,000 students. You know, it, it, it sounds good, but there are some people who are saying, yeah. how are you going to pay for it? Sure. The Republican leader in the Senate, Len Fasano, is asking, yeah. where's this money coming from to pick sure. up these tuitions? Uh, it, it's, a, it's entirely philanthropy, right? So we estimate that uh, to pay for this, at, uh, when it's fully rolled out, it'll be a, a million dollars per year per cohort. So after four years, it'll, we'll need $4 million a year more to the operating budget. The plan is to have an aggressive campaign over the next four years to raise approximately $100 million, which will throw off, uh, as an endowment, will throw off uh, about $4 million a year and fully cover the cost of this program. Will this uh, come from the UConn Foundation at all? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the foundation is our primary arm for fundraising, right? So it'll come from, it will come from new gifts to the university, and all the gifts to the university go to the foundation. You know, there's been some criticism of the foundation over the years that it kind of operates under a cloak of secrecy, that the donors aren't listed. Do you think that should be public? Well, you know, I think it's a, a reflection of donor wishes. So uh, if a donor would like to remain anonymous, then uh, we respect that. Um, most of our donors are generous and proud of their Yukon connection and don't want to be anonymous. And so we put their names on buildings, we put their names on scholarship funds, we put their names on the doors, the doors of our offices. Uh, we're happy to do that. So, so it really is a reflection of what it is that the donor wants to do. I want to talk about athletics a little bit, and let's begin with... Uh uh, in terms of the athletes, should they be paid at all, NCAA athletes? There's a lot of talk that they don't have a lot of money and that they should be able to at least sell their image. Yeah, and you know, there's a nice article on this by Chris Murphy, our, you know, our senator. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, when I visited with him, we actually didn't have time to get into it uh, uh, 
in our in our meeting. Uh, so I don't think so, and I, I, I analogize it this way, is that we are a whole university, we are one university, and each person contributes in a unique way to the value proposition that makes this a great university. The, uh, the academic analog of this would be, there are faculty who teach large intro courses, you know, that might have 400 students in an intro biology course, and if you look at the tuition revenue that they generate, these would be the highest paid faculty in the university. But then, of course, we couldn't afford then to pay the faculty to teach the small focused seminars that are 20, uh, 20 students in size at the upper division level. So it's everybody sort of giving to the university, everyone benefiting from the university, and we don't really redirect resources to one individual or set of, set of individuals. But I do believe strongly in um, supporting our student athletes with strong, with full cost of education scholarships, right? And, and um, so that's something the NCAA is moving towards uh, increasingly, and that's a, a really good direction. Men's basketball coach Dan Hurley is putting out a call that people should come to the games because attendance was a little off last year yeah. and they yeah. didn't have the greatest year. Yeah. How do you get people in the seats? Well, you know, I'm really excited about our move back to the Big East. And, and when I met with our undergraduate student leaders, I was so impressed with my first meeting with them. This was before I became president. The first thing they wanted to ask me about was um, what could we do to improve transition services for branch and transfers from the regional campuses. They saw their peers struggling and not getting the kind of orientation materials and supports they needed. I asked if any of them were branch and transfers, and they said no. And it, I was just, you know, just amazed that these students really care about about each other, about the community and the world. The second question they asked me is, can you get us back into the Big East? And uh, uh, you know, we laughed a little bit about that. And, and there was a reason for that. And they, they articulated it better than anyone. They said, you know, these are, the, these are the regional rivalries we grew up caring about. These are the games we want to come and see. We want to come and cheer for our team to play against. You know, this is what we care about. And, and that, fill, that fills the stands. I, I came from two really outstanding rivalries, you know, UNC Duke mm -hmm. and USC UCLA. I understand the importance of these regional rivalries to the whole academic and, and general experience on a university campus. I was at the football game at Rancher yeah. Field, Pratt yeah. Whitney Stadium this past yeah. weekend, as were USA there. Yeah. I, but the crowd, yeah. I mean, let's be honest, it was not an impressive crowd. You looked around, there were more yeah. empty seats than yeah. people in them. Yeah. How do you get people to go to these football games? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a short answer to that. You start winning and um, people will come. I mean, that's the number one thing. Uh, what, what I saw there was uh, some really fine football being played, actually. So I'm a big football fan, and I, I enjoyed it. Not it was enough, a good game, yeah. Not enough football to win the game, but, um, but it was, uh, was great football. And what I'm looking for, you know, in, in all of the, the college sports is for the team to um, have high academic standing. I'd like, uh, I asked the athletic director that the athletes should have um, academic performance on par with the rest of the campus or better, and uh, to compete for to compete for championships, to, to contend. And uh, so it's important to me that the team uh, be in a situation where it can compete for bowl eligibility and compete to win bowl games. And that's that's what it's all about. And um, I, I am a believer that that's where students le learn the most, and uh, it also benefits the broader community. I'm not a big believer that you learn more from losing than winning, or more from winning all the time for that matter, but it's about understanding the difference that effort makes when you're in contention. If you look at other big state universities, University of Michigan, the U of VA, where you came yeah. from, everything is all one-stop shopping. And here in yeah. Connecticut, we have the business school downtown, the law school in another part of town, yeah. we have the campus and stores yeah. and the football stadium in East Hartford. If you had to do it over again, if you were in charge 20 years ago, yeah. would you have said, let's put the, state, the stadium either in stores or in downtown Hartford? Um, because it does seem to, I mean, it is a desert out there, and yeah. a lot of people complain that the location is part of the problem. Well, you know, the, the fact that we have all of these regional campuses is a huge advantage for, for UConn as a whole, and so I'm glad you brought those up. I, I think it, it helps us uh, further our mission uh, to have these regionals where it's, um, they're, they reach different demographics of students. They give students a different kind of experience. In Stanford, you can have the urban residential experience, and uh, you can have the bucolic experience of stores. Uh, so in general, the, the distributed nature, and yet having the faculty all from this, the same department. So the, the mothership could be based, if it's, if it's politics, it's based in Hartford. If it's business, it's based in stores. But the faculty are, are all part of one department. It's a, it's a great model. As far as the stadium, sta the stadium goes, uh, you know, I have a little bias here that, you know, I really think sports, the, the number one priority for the sports is it belongs to the student athletes. And so uh, I would have a, a preference for a stadium that was 
where, where the where the mothership is. But uh, you know, it, we you know pros and cons to the situation we now have. What's done is done. All right. Yeah. Thomas Katsalias, the new president of UConn. We appreciate you being on the program today. Thank you for your questions, Dennis. When we come